Hello and how's it going everyone? It is Skullzy here with the latest gaming news, rumors, and speculation. I can't think of a better comeback video than breaking down that Xbox 2022 Starfield Showcase. This video will be huge and those of you already familiar with the channel should know just how in-depth I tend to get with videos like these. I'll be breaking down every statement from the most luxurious Todd Howard himself as well as every individual pixel from all that sparkly gameplay footage as well. And I am definitely hyped. I'm finally back from my summer break and I missed each and every single one of you. Now we have a lot of Starfield info to go through here so let's not waste any more time and get straight into today's content. I'll be breaking down that Starfield showcase and gameplay in chronomythological order, starting from the beginning and skipping over anything that's not important, and most of this is pretty important, so we're basically not going to be skipping through anything here. I'll also be showing the entire gameplay and Starfield showcase itself as well, so buckle in, because this is going to be a long one. Let's go ahead and get started. First off, Xbox reminds us that Starfield is definitely Microsoft exclusive, meaning for Xbox and PC only, which I'm sure most of us already knew that a long time ago. This also probably angered more console warriors. Then the showcase begins with a quote from the 19th century French poet Antoloni France, and sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly there, but yes, there is a French poet named France. The quote is, The wonder is not that the field of stars is so vast, but that man has measured it, likely alluding to the wonders of space that mankind was encountering as they were just beginning to chart the very stars themselves, and also how wonderfully exciting such endeavors are, the very same excitement that we as the player will most likely feel as we explore the universe within Starfield. It seems that's the very tone of this game here, is the wonder and mystery, and the feeling we will feel as we explore space. Next, we have a voice that I swear is Todd Howard, or one of his many clones, which are now apparently used by Bethesda for voice acting purposes, but the voice is clearly a crew member of the player's spaceship known as Constellation Starship Frontier. We know Frontier is the name of the player's ship from previous Starfield updates, and that Constellation is the in-game faction focusing on exploring space, a faction that the player too joins within the game's main story. Frontier seems to be communicating with a spaceflight control tower of some kind, saying that they're ready to start and are just awaiting the signal. Nothing really groundbreaking here, but I still swear this is freaking Todd Howard talking. Next, we can see what many believe to be representative of the in-game map, but that hasn't been necessarily confirmed or proven yet. This could just be a common asset of a star background image that Bethesda uses, but either way, the mysterious Todd Howard clone voice continues on by narrating what seems to be the player's starship going through a hyper-jump sequence of some kind, jumping to another star system, once again indicating that Starfield will indeed have its own version of warp drive. We can hear the Frontier is rerouting more power to the reactor core to allow for better power utilization during the resource heavy space jump and finally it activates a grav shield of some kind. Indicating technology exists within Starfield to shield spaceships during these space jump maneuvers. This likely shields the spaceship from high frequency radiation encountered during warp travel, as well as protecting the ship from any physical or kinetic debris encountered along the way as well. Then Todd activates hype countdown mode. showing some of the gameplay footage that we'll be breaking down later on when it's shown during the showcase without the skooma trip filter mode activated. Todd Howard then manifests on stage, acknowledging just how hyped and excited the community has been for Starfield, and how excited Bethesda is to finally show it off. Todd states that Starfield is without a doubt Bethesda's most ambitious game ever, and it's not just an RPG, but it's an epic RPG, where you get to be who you want and go where you want, indicating the game's replayability factor is likely well over 9,000. Todd then refuses to waste any more time on foreplay and jumps straight into the gameplay. This gameplay is set on a mysterious moon known as as Crete. We can see it's definitely a rocky, somewhat barren moon surface with strange green and yellow gases seeping from the rocky surface as well, but it's not completely barren. It has strange alien plant life and even creatures that we'll see 
later on on the planet's surface. We can also see a structure of some kind, which we'll be seeing a lot more here of very shortly, and overall the game world looks detailed and very interesting, and this will be one of many, many, many biomes that we can encounter in this game. We can then see the Sol date, or Earth date, is May 7th, 2330, meaning that future humans do not use the European date format. I can't wait to see the arguments down in the comments below about that for some reason. The game is set roughly 300 years in the future, though, so it'll be interesting to see what happened to the Earth within Starfield's lore during that time period. We can then see that Crete is one of the moons of a planet named Ancelon, which at the time we know nothing about, but we can see that the player's ship begins landing upon Crete's surface, and so far the music and sound design definitely set the tone and vibe for this game quite well. The camera changes to a side view of the ship itself as it makes its landing, and I believe we will most likely see a cutscene like this each time we land on the planet's surface, as it was later confirmed that we won't be able to actually land manually on planet surfaces, but it will be a cutscene of sorts. Which does bother me a little bit, but it's nothing that kills my hype completely though, as it's not game breaking or anything, but it would have just been a nice little side feature to be able to manually land on planet surfaces ourselves. One of my favorite things about No Man's Sky is passing through the atmosphere of a new planet for the first time, seeing the planet appear before me, and then finding somewhere to land. It definitely adds to that immersion, but I can totally understand at the same time why Bethesda decided to not add this into the game, because it would have probably taken a lot of work and time on the developer side to add this, and they probably felt the feature didn't add enough to the game when compared to the workload required to actually code it in. The particle and smoke effects look awesome though, and I hope that a different type of dust and sediment effect would be stirred up depending on what type of planet we land on each time, because again, immersion. The details on the ship look great too, and we can even see within the ship's cockpit, which is a great sign, because it would have been kind of lame if it was just a opaque texture with no transparency. The fact that we can see inside the ship itself adds to that immersion factor and that detail. Next, we jump straight into the perspective of the player themselves, with our robot companion Vasco leading the charge onto Crete's surface. We can see the familiar heads-up display from previous leaked Starfield images, only it's a little bit more improved and streamlined. It's pretty simple and clean, and I actually kind of dig it. I don't like the super intrusive or massive heads-up displays, so this one just works. In the lower right, we can see the player's health bar on top, and underneath that, we can see the currently equipped weapon, which is the semi-auto Eon pistol. We can see this pistol holds about 12 rounds, and the player has 80 rounds in reserve. The player also has 10 frag grenades equipped, which both confirms grenades will be in the game, as well as probably various grenade types, which we will see more of later. The lower left indicates the player's current oxygen level, as not every planet will obviously have a breathable atmosphere, and interestingly enough, we can also see a CO2 meter, indicating that the player may build up CO2 as we use up oxygen. The CO2 may be able to be vented out as the propulsion source of the player's jetpack though, but we don't have that confirmed quite yet. We can also see a visual indicator of the current planet or moon we are on, showing the time of day and other information. The planetary heads-up display element will likely change and be updated with more information based upon what type of planet or moon we are currently on. And again, just look at the detail inside the ship here. Bethesda definitely improved their graphics for this game. Starfield will truly be the first full next-gen BGS RPG experience. We can see the legendary ladder greeting us in this shot here, indicating that Bethesda's experience with actually coding ladders into their game may have actually improved. We can also see various cargo and boxes strapped to the interior of the ship to hold them in place during space travel, but that's basically about it for the scene here. The lighting, though, as the door lowers, looks great and gives me some heavy ray tracing vibes, but again, I don't believe ray tracing is confirmed either. And I could say this during every scene, so I'll just say it one final time, the sound design in this entire gameplay is so great throughout everything, from the gunplay to the doors and everything beyond. We can see Vasco doing big old robot stompy waddle times, and he totally reminds us that according to the scanners, a certain research facility that is apparently part of one of our quests is just up ahead. Likely also marked on our map as well, which means that Vasco is our very own space Preston Garvey. We can also see a No Man's Sky style scanning system within the game, which has the community kind of twisted. A lot of people are thinking this is a No Man's Sky clone just because it has a scanning system, but you can't just say a game is, is a clone of another game because it has, like, a, an element from the game. Both games are set in space, so there's going to be obvious similarities to begin with. Just because both games are set in space and have scanning doesn't mean it's a clone. Personally, I I love that the scanning system is within Starfield. We can see Crete has a handful of
of things for us to discover. Eight resources, no fauna, and two flora awaiting for us to scan and discover, indicating that each planet or moon will likely have its own discovery collection for the player to find and scan if they choose. One curious thing that stands out to me though is we can see here there is zero fauna on Crete, but later on we definitely see some fauna, like less than 30 seconds from now. So I'm not sure what's going on with that, but I don't, maybe, maybe that'll be explained at some point in the game. Maybe it's just a glitch in terms of this gameplay footage, I'm not sure. But we can also see that the current moon's biome that the player is in has at least 50% of these scannables within, further indicating that if we want to find everything, we'll have to go to different biomes on the moon or planet surface. It also appears that we can seek out and attempt to scan every individual plant of a species on a planet because we can see that we've scanned 13% of dust root on Crete. That might not be what this indicates though, but I don't think, I can't think of what else it would be, so that's my best guess. And also, when the player switches to the scanner, we can see the equipped weapon changes to a tool known as the Cutter, which is likely something we use to harvest resources in-game that also must be part of the scanning system. The Cutter holds 100 charges of fuel with 100 charges in reserve as well. On the bottom of the screen, we can see a few buttons of interest too, the most exciting one being Photo Mode. I am so unreasonably hyped there is a photo mode in Starfield. Also, we can see an outpost button, indicating that the player can very likely build an outpost anywhere on any planet they want, which we will also see more of later in this video. And last, we can see Toggle Guide. It's, it's not clear what Toggle Guide does, maybe it just shows you a pathway, kind of like clairvoyance in Skyrim, showing you where to go to get to your objective, or maybe, hopefully what I think it is, is some type of in-game encyclopedia that catalogs all of our discoveries, as well as explaining information about the game's world and lore, similar to the Mass Effect Codex, for example. The player then moves towards their quest objective, being the research lab, and immediately encounters some of that no fauna that's supposed to be here. I, I, like, I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on, there, but either way, we can see these are big old alien bugs, covered in a hard carapace likely to protect them from solar radiation, as I doubt Crete has a strong magnetic field or much of an atmosphere to protect from those solar winds. The planet definitely gives me some Morrowind vibes though for some reason, and I'm glad Bethesda is going more of a space fantasy route with world design as this place definitely looks alien. The game then briefly shows off some of that third person view, which the animation looks good and solid, and a little bit more than what you would expect from a Bethesda Game Studios game because they tend to put the focus on first person, which I mostly play in first person anyway. The only time I switch to third person is to just look at my armor. I almost never play in third person in the BGS game. And then we see more of that zero fauna. We, we almost have a crab battle here though with something called a Crete Stalker, and it's the very same alien crab creature we saw in previous Starfield concept art. Apparently these crabs must have some level of high intelligence as they immediately know what guns are and the player scares them off with one, and then the player continues on. Hopefully this wasn't just some kind of scripted moment for the showcase here, and moments like these can actually happen organically in game, as we try to feel out the hostility levels of new alien creatures we discover. And again the detail here in the environment looks amazing. The rocks and ground are highly detailed and these rock formations almost look like they could have been on the bottom of an ocean or a lake at some point, judging by the erosion and the vague similarities to how coral looks. The design of the Crete Stalker is also very alien, with a tower-like carapace appendix sticking up that appears like it could be part of the head or perhaps perform some sort of other sensory function. Combined with two frontal crab-like claws, the Crete Stalker appears to have eight legs and several spike-like protrusions on its flank. Judging by the name, they are likely local only to the moon of Crete, making me wonder if each individual planet or moon could have its own variation of flora and fauna if the atmosphere could support life which would make sense and add to that immersion value for sure, but would of course require a bunch of design and artwork, even if procedural generation was used when creating new planets and animals. While I love No Man's Sky, some of the procedurally generated animals look like cartoon characters, so that would be cool if Bethesda could avoid that. Next up, on our way to a little rock alcove, we run past what looks like some sort of unique plant or fungi on our right. I'm not sure if this is a rock or a plant or a mushroom or whatever it is, but it definitely stands out, making me think it's either a harvestable resource 
or in the least something we can scan to progress our total Crete flora collection. And speaking of harvesting resources, next up we actually harvest some resources. Using that same definitely not from No Man's Sky scanning technology, we can see we have discovered iron. Yay! But we can also see that iron has its elemental prefix shown as well, which in this case is Fe. Starfield is definitely using at least 5% science. We then use a mining laser beam known as the Cutter to harvest the iron ore. While nothing revolutionary in terms of gameplay, it is nice to know that there seems to be a resource harvesting system in this game that adds to the overall depth of the game world and especially the crafting system. One thing that stood out to me though in the upper right here is when the player harvested this original piece of iron, it simply said, iron added. It didn't say how much, and it only popped up on screen once despite the player having harvested multiple nodes. Even if we only get one piece of iron per node, which would be kinda odd, I still would have expected that pop-up would trigger it with each individual piece of iron we harvested, especially if each node was just one single iron ore. Maybe I'm being a bit nitpicky here, but things like that matter in terms of presentation and immersion in my opinion. Next up, we leave a little rock alcove to head to the quest objective, this outpost. One thing of interest though, is up on the upper left here, up in the hills, we can see two reflective red objects. They almost look a bit transparent and seems like they could be even a visual glitch of some kind, but maybe they are part of a structure we can only see a little piece of. Also, Crete's irritable bowel syndrome continues to pollute the atmosphere with likely toxic green-yellow gas. Bethesda, please allow these to explode if I throw a grenade into the fart holes. This is very important. Then we arrive at the Crete Research Lab for whatever quest we are on. We can see like BGS games of old, we earn experience points by discovering Covering new areas and points of interest, which especially makes sense for Starfield as exploration is one of the main core elements of the game. Below we can see a massive structure which is indeed the Crete Research Outpost. The building is quite large with multiple levels and office-like outcrops along with several areas for loading and storing cargo on the outside ground level. We can also see a large tower on top, likely used as a watchtower, to keep a lookout for things such as bandits who actually took this place over, which we'll learn about here shortly. Watchtower failed everybody confirmed. Also over here on the left we can see a Crimson Fleet Ghost, a ship which is part of the confirmed Starfield pirate faction. Basically space bandits. Vasco tells the player that the ship means we need to prepare for a fight to accomplish whatever unknown quest objective we are here for. The player prepares their main weapon, an assault rifle or SMG-like firearm named the Grendel. The Grendel looks like a futuristic P90 SMG which holds 50 rounds in a single clip and the clip appears to be a long horizontal clip which chambers onto the top of the weapon as seen by the demonstrated reload animation. And then this next part I love, for two reasons. One, we get a super jump in this game, likely boosted by the jetpack on the player's back. And two, the player hurts themselves with the power jump, just as the dramatic music plays in the background for emotional effect. It just works. The camera then cuts to storming the facility. We run through the lower ground level doors into the research lab and pass a somewhat dark and dingy storage room. As we sneak through the next room, which appears to be a workshop of some kind, you can see the Grendel actually displays the current ammo count on top of the clip. The gameplay then cuts from room to room as the player travels through the facility, eventually leading to the player running through a rundown lab with eerie static monitor the ring times. Also this area seems to have some corpses around, probably the previous previous owners of the Crete Research Lab, who were executed by the bandits. The player enters Lab 1, which is a massive room and showcases our first in-game combat. The room is full of desks and workstations for various research purposes, complete with potted plants for that nature aesthetic. Hard to tell exactly what they are researching here though, but we can hear the pirates discussing various defensive tactics as they seem to be somewhat aware of the player's presence and approach. They state that they will hold them off in this room while somebody gets set up on the roof. No one's getting through though, or at least that's what they think, as the player then disagrees with them by using bullets. The pirates are level 2, indicating that this is very likely early on in the game, unless the enemies don't scale to the player's level. We, we don't know about that for sure yet, but overall the first enemy drops rather quickly, and so does the second enemy as they attempt to bring a knife to a gunfight. It's nice that the enemies aren't bullet sponges though, but of course these are just low level bandit enemies so they could just be defeated rather easily. One thing I want to point out here though, are the weapon and ragdoll physics. I've seen people complain that the enemies aren't reactive enough, 
to being shot. However, real life doesn't have Hitman 2 gun physics. When you shoot somebody, they generally don't go flying backwards or falling away. They usually just kind of fall over. If we pay close attention to how these two enemies die, it looks fairly realistic in my opinion. Also, we have to take into consideration the weapon caliber. The Grendel seems to be somewhat of a submachine gun more than an assault rifle, meaning its bullet size is likely smaller, having less impact than, say, a sawed-off shotgun or something, which we'll also get to see here in a bit shortly as well. And my final thought here before moving on, Starfield takes place hundreds of years into the future. Weapon recoil likely has been reduced significantly as firearm technology progressed. We also get a small amount of EXP per kill, and we can see an inventory loot menu pop up for a second with the familiar take and transfer options that we've seen in previous Bethesda Game Studios games. But it seems like for the purposes of the showcase demo, these pirates don't have any loot. They probably aren't very good pirates then. As we run past their corpses in glee, we notice a plant of sorts in an incubation chamber looking thing, meaning the Crete Research Lab was likely researching the flora of the planet or something related to plants for some reason. Moving on to the next scene, the player progresses through another lab-like room. We can see the corpse man on the floor living his best life and a few pirates in the background moving to defensive positions. The pirates have the legendary accuracy of a stormtrooper as they somehow miss the player even when their projectiles pass directly through them and to celebrate their immortality. Our player does a cool Apex Legend slide while generously giving these pirates some of their bullets back. Notice how we somewhat shoot the gun out of the pirate's hand. That's pretty neat. Next up, the player takes cover behind a wall as they throw a grenade for literally no reason, as they immediately rush out before the grenade explodes and kills the only enemy the grenade would have affected. We got to see this dude ragdoll into the wall though, so I guess that's kind of worth it. What isn't cool though is there isn't any dismemberment like we would have seen in Fallout games. A grenade would have definitely blown some limbs off. Hopefully Starfield has that feature as it adds to the realism and immersion, and this game system already exists in Fallout, so why not make use of it in Starfield as well? Next up, our bulletproof player rushes through the stairs with his lore armor and switches to a double barrel shotgun known as the Coachman. Here we can see some of those actual realistic weapon physics like I mentioned earlier. The shotgun shells of the Coachman no doubt carry a lot more punch than the SMG, which is showcased as we blow the enemy's leg out from underneath them. Again though, if this was Fallout, that leg probably would have been blown off. Even in real life, a huge chunk of that leg would be gone after that, so I hope Bethesda didn't skip out on that level of immersion here, especially when that feature, like I said, is already in Fallout and has been for some time. Different franchise, sure, but it's still a BGS RPG with FPS elements and explosions. Next up, we move into a loot room. We can see some sort of strange alien or beaten-like creature on the planning board with the words experimental analysis of selected something, something, something. The, the words kind of become unreadable there. The rest of the board seems to have notes and formulas related to this analysis and creature. Maybe they were making mutants here or just simply researching the local Crete wildlife. It's, it's hard to say. Our player is more interested in and looting though. We approach a weapons case secured by a novice level lock. Our player picks the lock showcasing Starfield's new digital lock picking system. Using a tool known as a digipick, we choose from various pin formations on the right to match the pin locations of the lock itself. By choosing the proper option, we progress to the next lock stage, repeating the same mechanic until the lock opens. The player seems to need to think ahead a bit here as once you seem to use an option on the left, the option becomes unavailable for further stages of this lock. As we can see here on the right as it's kind of grayed out and removed from our available options. It's a fairly straightforward system that no doubt gets more complicated as the level of the lock increases and there are likely several skills or perks that can make lock picking easier. There also seems to be an auto slot option as well, indicating we very well likely have access to tools that can automatically pick locks for the player, but these tools probably have minimal uses. We also get EXP for picking the lock, indicating we get experience in Starfield through multiple in-game actions and not just by exploration and defeating enemies. By unlocking the case, we get a new weapon, the Equinox, which seems to be a high-powered laser weapon, but it's not. More on that later, but yes, lasers are in Starfield. The Equinox holds 20 charges and looks like something straight from Doom. And next, we exit the structure with the Equinox and are met with either pirates with horrible tactical decision-making or bad enemy AI. Maybe the enemies here are supposed to not be very smart tactically, so the game represents them by having some of them just not even run for cover, others stand on top of potential cover, and further still, some leaving the fight entirely and going for a short walk. I'm going to chalk all this up to the AI still needing some work. Starfield is still many months away, so I am sure the enemy AI will be greatly improved at launch. 
or at least here's hoping. But moving on, we can see the Equinox does about as much damage as the Grendel, which is a bit of a disappointment, as I'd expect a weapon that holds 20 rounds as opposed to the Grendel's 50 would do a lot more damage in my opinion, especially when you consider the Equinox's slow fire rate and the fact that we had to pick a lock to get it. We also see pirate reinforcements get called in, that are maybe the ship just meant to be their escape vessel for the pirates, which would explain this guy losing interest in the fight and heading towards the ship. We also see the quest is called One Small Step, as it gets updated in the top left of the screen. Still not sure what the quest is though. We kill a pirate with horrible decision making as he stands on top of an object in the middle of a gunfight, and then we head to intercept the ship. We punish the enemy's horrible AI by turning him into a live action fireworks show. It seems like targeting certain enemy jetpacks can cause them to go flying, which is pretty cool and definitely immersive, Todd. And also maybe it's something I missed, but I didn't notice any blood splatter from any enemies being injured during any of these fights. Just a small complaint, maybe, but it seems like a step back from the immersive elements already present in previous Bethesda Game Studios games. We then rush the pirate ship by doing a cool boost jump and take out the last remaining pirates by doing some awesome jetpack flight combat before landing next to a live grenade, which kills the enemy without hurting us at all. All praise the demo immortality plot armor. Then a random Todd appears. He explains that after having a few starting quests, we are invited to join the game's main story-based faction, Constellation, which focuses on exploring space and solving its great mysteries and are actually the last group of official space explorers. Constellation quests will likely drive forward the main story of Starfield, which is confirmed to be the longest main story out of any BGS game yet, and Constellation is based out of the city of New Atlantis, the capital of the game's most powerful and political military faction known as the United Colonies. Opposed to the UC are the Freestar Collective, who focus more on individual liberties than political or military power. We then see a cutscene of our ship landing within one of New Atlantis's landing zones. Before this scene cuts to a spanning view of the city itself. The city looks decently sized, certainly not as large as Night City from Cyberpunk, but it does have some cool sci fi architecture. The city looks like it boasts cutting edge technology and construction, as everything looks new, clean, and well maintained. There are a handful of tall skyscrapers in the background, combined with a lot of lush greenery, fountains, trees, and overall decent decor in the foreground for balance. There's also a towering, wing like structure with the UC logo on it, reminding everyone who truly is in power here, and who's in charge. Bethesda has stated that New Atlantis is their largest city out of any game yet, so the view here is probably only one small portion of the city itself. We can also see that New Atlantis is built on the planet Jameson, which we know from previous trailers to be located within a very real Alpha Centauri binary star system. We can see several citizens walking around doing permanent citizen fetch quests, but it's nice to see the city looks significantly lived in though, as there are quite a lot of people here, and one thing of note to watch out for is they aren't doing like the standard three or four animations we see most NPCs do in previous BGS RPGs. Within New Atlantis, we can see people chilling on benches, or structures, carrying briefcases, going to work, having conversations, getting in arguments, standing guard, going in and out of buildings, and much more. Further still, the overall NPC design is varied, and looks pretty good, fitting the overall vibe and the tone in the game world. We can see everything from spacers to business class and also children. Here we can see a boarding zone area as various signs state directions to various landing pads and notices remind travelers to be sure they actually have clearance for interplanetary passage, meaning for the overall citizen you likely need to purchase tickets or get special permission to travel to other interstellar bodies. The somewhat restrictive travel to the overall populace seems to be one of the first indications of how the United Colonies actually operates. Combined with the sign here stating that all travelers and their cargo are actually subject to complete search and that any potential threats will be taken very seriously. It seems like the vibe for the United Colonies should be obvious already. We can also see various signage indicating where hotels, stores, and the UC security offices are located. Various NPCs also seem to take notice of one another, as indicated by the strange walking staring contest between these two NPCs here. Overall though, I do love the design of New Atlantis. From the architecture to the glass ceilings to the garden areas, everything looks well designed and helps give more personality and identity to both the United Colonies as well as the city itself. Here we can see a short walk through a garden area with various people moving about or just hanging out, along with various UC banners and some abstract designs and art throughout. Various guards can also be seen patrolling or just posted up, kitted out with obvious high-tech combat gear and assault weapons, meaning if you cause any trouble in New Atlantis, you'll probably have quite a fight on your hands. Also we see either SSNN or NNSS on this post here, not sure what that stands stands for, but what's pretty interesting is we will see this exact thing in other settlements outside of the United Colonies. 
then Vasco and the player approach, some fancy walls and a door that looks like it could be straight from a dwarven rune out of the Elder Scrolls. The walls are full of beautiful ivy, and the door itself has somewhat space-themed decorative imagery on it. By using our very special Starfield Collector's Edition Constellation watch, which hopefully doesn't use any canvas that could possibly be out of stock with us, we verify our identity and we get clearance into the Constellation headquarters. The visuals of the game switch up a bit as we enter Constellation HQ, a room that contrasts the high technology sci-fi we've seen so far in New Atlantis. This room resembles an old but well-kept library with wooden floors, walls, and decor along with some old-style wooden furniture. We can also see several books on the shelves including the upper balcony area with a ton of books as well and the central station in the middle of the room which seems to act as a projector of sorts which we'll see some of here shortly. We are welcomed by who seems to be the potential leader of Constellation and whom I will refer to as the leader of Constellation from this point forward a woman who was also present in previous Starfield promotional material as well as the narrator from the previous official trailers. We can then see various members of Constellation as we are told what Constellation actually needs our help with, finding these artifacts here. Artifacts that seem to be individual pieces of something that, when placed together, seem to solve some huge space mystery, something which is literally everything Constellation has been looking for apparently. As to what these artifacts are and what they actually do, nobody really knows, but we as the player will be seeking these artifacts out and trying to determine what purpose they serve. This seems to be the Constellation-focused main quest, finding and solving the mystery of these great artifacts. As for the artifacts themselves, they look like the general supreme yet ancient unfathomable technology from some ancient alien race that we've seen in previous sci-fi games and universes, but with a special Starfield twist. They look almost magical, organic like synthetic, stone-like yet metallic. And here we can see the artifacts look more like broken pieces of some larger structure, but here the artifacts almost look crystal-like, defying physics themselves as they float about with space fantasy-like qualities, and I'm not sure if Bethesda did this just for a dramatic transitional effect, or if it's on purpose, but when the player tries to interact with one of these cubes, they seem to enter high-level space skooma trip-out mode, or maybe they get a vision of some kind, but again, this might not be gameplay or story related and could just be a transition used for this specific showcase, but I think there's something more to this, and and we'll find out why here shortly. We then cut to a scene of the player and a few other Constellation members walking out to a ship docking on the landing pad. We can see an engineer working on what appears to be a heavy mech or metal combat platform of some kind, which is super interesting. Maybe we as the player could actually get the pilot mech suits within Starfield. That would be pretty awesome. And overall, the members of Constellation have pretty much the same outfitting with the white exosuits, jetpacks, and Constellation colors and imagery on their kits. One thing that stands out to me though is it appears like this is is actually the player's ship, only at this point in time in the gameplay, I don't think it's the player's ship yet. I believe the player here just joined Constellation, and upon doing so, the group gifted the player the spaceship we've seen in trailers and other footage thus far. Other than that though, we can see various cargo and futuristic loading shuttles used for loading and unloading ships in this scene. We are then introduced to another member of Constellation, an NPC named Barrett. He asks the player referred to as the new guy here about this artifact we found. He then says, so you saw it, the visions indicating these artifacts definitely have some space magic thing going on, and by finding all these artifacts, we as the player can help solve this grand mystery, and maybe even find intelligent alien life, or at least that's the vibes I'm picking up on here. The next scene takes us to Aquila, the capital of the faction known as the Freestar Collective, a faction that exists in opposition to the United Colonies, despite the shaky ceasefire that currently exists between the two groups. Despite Freestar focusing more on individual liberties than political or military power, the city itself definitely looks heavily defended and military focused, with high walls, several guard towers, and plenty of sensors and listening devices. This makes sense though, as the planet on which Aquila is located is very dangerous, home to a vicious species known as the Ashta, who are said to be like a horrible, dangerous combination between a wolf and a velociraptor. While not as advanced as New Atlantis or Neon, Aquila looks like a sustainable and well-defended city, perhaps serving as Starfield's version of a space western setting. The planet itself looks almost like a barren plains biome, with very few trees and dry-looking vegetation and grass, combined with tall mountain ranges in the background. There also appears to be various roads and trenches outside of the city, and the trenches look like they serve most likely an irrigation purpose. The next few scenes go by rather quickly, as the leader 
of Constellation narrates that the artifact we discovered was one of many, scattered amongst the galaxy, and if we can find more, we can unlock their secrets. This statement alone tells us at least what the initial main quest will be focused on. As for these scenes themselves, we see the player on a rather barren red planet that definitely has some Mars vibes, and the visuals appear very industrial, indicating this area is either a factory, quarry, or a mine of some kind. We can see several dust-covered pipes and passageways going in different directions, along with a building in the back left, covered with a roof-like shield, perhaps shielding the structure itself from constant radiation exposure from the sun, as this planet most likely doesn't have a very thick atmosphere, if any at all. Next, we are taken to a tropical planet, which seems to be themed towards being a vacation area or a resort. It's beautiful here, with tropical-like trees and plants lining the clean and maintained walkways, leading to a building named Paradiso, which is most likely a resort or a hotel of some kind. The variants in biomes and visuals so far is pretty awesome and is definitely a good sign. Next, we see Neon, the party city on the sea, identifiable by the glowing golden dome up in the sky. Neon looks very cyberpunk with several hotels, medical labs, spaceports and transit terminals, and other various shops and sites, and the city definitely looks multi-layered, with fancier high-class areas towards the top and a lower-class slums below. Above the city itself seems to be various walkways, likely used for both maintenance and security purposes. A sniper might be watching your every step up on the upper levels. I love this vibe, though. There are so many people walking around, and for the most part so far, the NPCs are varied and aren't repeated models. We can also see inside several Several of the shop windows here, indicating we very well could enter almost every building in every city. I expect we as a player to actually be able to stay in all the hotels, shop at all the shops, get cybernetic upgrades at all the medical clinics, and so much more, but that's just me maybe guessing here and perhaps having high hopes. And while this shot is clearly the upper levels of Neon, in stark contrast, here we can see the lower levels. As I said, a lot more rundown and sketchy, but still, even down here, we have access to basically every type of shop and service we saw up top only probably a lot cheaper and a lot less in quality. Heavy cyberpunk vibes again, complete with the cybernetic looking logo image thing back here, likely some sort of Starfield's own version of a ripper dock, and we can also see what appears to be some homeless people sitting on couches next to unfortunate piles of garbage in the streets. The sheer amount of NPCs here makes me wonder how dialogue would work while talking to these random NPCs within Starfield. Will we be hearing a lot of generic repeated phrases from NPCs without direct quest associations? That's one of my big worries, but don't worry because it is confirmed that Starfield has the most recorded dialogue out of any previous Bethesda Game Studios yet, and alongside the fact that the player character themselves will not have any voice dialogue at all, I'd have to say I expect there to be a lot less repetitive generic dialogue within this game but only time will tell. Here we can see an interior shot of Aquila, complete with those space western vibes I mentioned previously. Gone are the maintained beautiful gardens and walkways of New Atlantis, replaced with dirty, muddy streets. We can see various shops and stalls offering their goods to passerbys, and even a bar that looks like it's called Shepherd's. This place is probably Commander Shepherd's favorite shop here in Aquila. Also in the back we can see an open deck which is likely a bar or a restaurant of some kind, but still a pretty neat detail, and even though Aquila isn't as fancy as New Atlantis or Neon, that doesn't mean it's any less busy as several people can be seen walking around with clothing and appearances distinct to Aquila and its setting. Next, we enter a rather fancy room that seems to be a museum, or simply a place for a rich guy to show off his collection. If I had to guess, this galactic collector man likely has an artifact we are looking for, which he does, and we'll see that here in a second, and we likely have to find a way to persuade him to part with it, or maybe just steal it. In this room, we can see several display cabinets that actually kind of look like a greatly remodeled display cabinet from Fallout 76, and we can also see several ancient looking statues. Some spacers or guards are standing around, although they don't really look armed, and in the background here, we can see somebody chilling on a couch by some TVs with their maximum brightness turned up to 1000. This room seems pretty clean and chill though, and definitely high class, with obvious extra attention paid to decor and luxury. Our player enters the room to talk to Galactic Collector Man, with what appears to be one of the artifacts we seek floating on a pedestal right there. It's like right there. The artifact appears to be stone-like, or perhaps metallic, and forms an arch set in multiple tiers. It definitely gives off the vibe that it is but one piece of a larger object, and it also seems to sparkle, indicating that it is a vampire from Twilight. The person in which we speak to dresses as fancy as this room, with golden adornments and jewels set into his luxurious attire, and we can even see the age-old issue 
from Skyrim where we can see necklaces kind of clipping through the clothing here. He definitely seems to talk though as if he is well educated and a bit proud and he tells us that the person that actually sold him this artifact said that it spoke to him, alluding to the previously mentioned visions that these artifacts seem to give the people who find them. Next, we see another angle of the previous scene from the upper levels of Neon, giving us a better view of the Reliant Medical Clinic and the rest of the street level. We can see the crowds and shops here going as far back as the eye can see. I just can't wait to explore the verticality of this area. Bethesda definitely took some inspiration from Cyberpunk 2077 urban design here with Neon, and I love it. Also, one final thing of interest, we see yet another NNSS pillar here, similar to the one we saw in New Atlantis, making me further wonder what these things even are and what they're used for, and what NNSS even is. Here we can see what looks to be an overseer in her office within a vault, only it's not. The office design looks great here though. The detail and the graphics are amazing, even the carpet looks good and you can see like every individual detail in it, and we can see some posters with a design that vaguely resembles Fallout advertisements. We can also see several books, a desk fan, a couple potted plants, a light switch, some various electronics, chairs, and everything else you'd expect to see in a fancy futuristic office. We also see a strange blue space rock looking thing on display here as well, which might be a meteor or something. And also some space tissues! Again, I love the aesthetic and vibes in this game. Everything from the barren planet outposts, to the library of consolation, to this office and beyond. Everything looks surprisingly great, better than I expected, and I actually had pretty high expectations. The leader of Consolation then mentions the Settled Systems is full of groups with their own priorities, other priorities, as we are introduced to the Space Pirate Faction within Starfield, known as the Crimson Fleet, a group which we as the player can join by the way, but as the leader states, the only way out of the Crimson Fleet is death. We then see what looks to be two members of the Crimson Fleet in the hold of a ship, preparing to attack an outpost on some moon or planet somewhere. We can see the exosuits of the pirates have red and crimson hues to them, so I guess their name just works, doesn't it, Todd? And they also look heavily armed. Combine that with the fact that they have a lot of clear combat armor on here, and I'd say not every member of the Crimson Fleet are as weak as the pirates we saw earlier at the Crete Research Labs. Overall, even the exosuits and gear of the Crimson Fleet look unique to that particular faction, and this is a dynamic that persists throughout Starfield for all the various groups and social classes. We can see the Crimson Fleet attacking the random outpost, as indicated by NPC Man 9000. That's the Crimson Fleet! A few members of Constellation rush to defensive positions as well as some other NPCs who aren't in Constellation gear. Maybe Constellation traveled to this random outpost seeking artifacts or knowledge on an artifact only to stumble into a Crimson Fleet raid. Likely by defending this outpost, we can get the age-old RPG reward of more information on something we're seeking, in which the people weren't very likely to share that information until we help them. Hard to tell what moon or planet this could be though, it doesn't quite look like Crete, so it's likely somewhere random in terms of the gameplay here. The Crimson Fleet rush out of their ship using that awesome tactical awareness they featured previously, rushing directly into open fire without any plan or cover at all, but hey, at least at least they look cool doing so. This one here is even rocking Starfield Skullsy Exosuit Pirate merch. Seems the overall colors of the Crimson Fleet are black, burgundy, gold, and obviously crimson. Not a bad aesthetic. We are then introduced to another faction, UC SysDef, likely the military arm of the United Colonies standing for United Colonies System Defense. The leader of SysDef, this guy, tells us that, somehow surprisingly, the Crimson Fleet Pirates don't follow the rules. While this news is quite the revelation and I'm sure many of you are quite shocked right now, we have a lot of stuff to break down here so I can only allow for a brief interlude to overcome this new emotional trauma. Because it's it's so depressing that you'd cry. US SysDef guy definitely looks like a military dude out in gold, silver, and gray, which seems to be the overall color scheme of Sistef. What they lack in color, though, they make up in technology, as their base here looks high-tech, clean, and organized. They also have a very military-focused uniform, similar to that of the Brotherhood of Steel, wearing berets and standing at attention and basically at ease in various locations throughout the footage here, and we can see various terminals and maintenance access points in the room, as well as a strategic resource planning center showcasing up-and-coming operational plans as well as any gathered field intelligence. Thanks to the futuristic digital age here, it seems like this information can be updated instantly, keeping SysDef HQ up to date with any tactical data and reconnaissance. 
Sistef states that if we join them, we can help rid the settled systems of the Crimson Fleet menace, indicating that we may have to side with either Sistef or the pirates here as they seem to be each other's sworn enemies, which makes sense as Sistef's main focus is to protect United Colony space. It would be cool though if we could kind of serve as a double agent and secretly be active in both organizations though. We then jump back to the pirate raid where we witness several Michael Bay sponsored explosions. The player character pulls out a new weapon which looks to be some sort of LMG, and then we take down another level 2 pirate quite easily. The LMG clearly does a lot more damage than the Grendel as it should. Also to the left here we can see some poor consolation member using a cutter in a gunfight. Not sure how effective that is but I can't imagine it works very well. This is likely indicative of how consolation is more focused on science and exploration rather than combat or military ventures. We then jump to the gates of Aquila, the capital city of the Freestar Collective, the faction that rivals the UC and their obsession for military power. The gates look like they're busy and like they remain open pretty much all the time, indicating that several people likely come and go into and out of Aquila with ease, showcasing how Freestar allows at least a bit more of citizen freedom of movement than the United Colony does, who requires specific permissions to travel outside of the colony or at least off planet. Aquila's main gate looks heavily defended despite remaining open though, as there are various watchtowers and defensive positions posted above, and above the main gate here, we can see Aquila was founded in 2167 by someone named Solomon Co. While we don't know anything about Solomon yet, we do know that Aquila has been around for well over 100 years by the time that Starfield actually takes place. On both the walls and the city throughout, we can see various radar dishes and sensors, and the watchtowers by the gates have giant spotlights on top of them, which likely get turned on as the sun sets. And one last thing to note, the concept art for the walls of Aquila showed skeletal remains of Ashta chained hanging up against the wall surface. However, that doesn't seem to be present in the actual gameplay footage here. Could be Bethesda removed that as it made the city seem too gruesome or power focused, which would make sense as Freestar isn't supposed to like that kind of stuff as, as much as the UC does at least. Or maybe Bethesda just put them on a different part of the city boundaries and they aren't near the main gates. We then meet the leader of the Freestar Collective, an older gentleman who tells us that Freestar isn't just there to shoot the bad guys, they are peacekeepers, protecting the people of the Collective, showing how Freestar isn't quite focused on power as the UC, like, like I keep saying, and I probably don't need to make that, that point anymore, but anyway, the leader of Freestar is an older guy, wearing brown leathers with three triangle pins on the left collar. Brown seems to be the overall main color of choice for anyone within Freestar forces, and also finally in the background here, we can see a blurred office that looks fairly clean and decorated and serves as kind of a meeting area, likely because we're meeting this guy for the first time, so he wants us to meet him in fancy meeting room place. The next scene takes us to another Freestar location named The Rock. This place seems to be a central barracks of sorts for Freestar forces, and we can see boxes and shelves, a few soldiers hanging around, some couches in the background, and a poster that looks like Freestar propaganda that states, feeding the front lines. And last, we can see what very well could be an ashtag on display here, with some pretty heavy Deathclaw vibes. The Ashta clearly are meant to be Starfield's answer to the Deathclaw, and I'm totally down, at least in, until I get attacked by one for the first time, I guess. Hopefully we don't need to gather any eggs for these. Overall, the design and aesthetic of the room here is in stark contrast to the high-tech and organized vibe of the United Colonies, meaning clearly the Free Star Collective are meant to be the underdogs of sorts here, but underdogs that stand up for the people before anything else. While the United Colonies may not treat their people horribly for the most part, it's clear what the ideological differences here between the two groups are. The next scene takes us to the Crimson Fleet's fetish room, as they clearly have quite the love for Red. It does set the tone that the Crimson Fleet are very bloodthirsty and edgy though, but still, they look like they actually have decent gear and tech, and their command center here has plenty of terminals and information panels to help plan strategic decisions, complete with a giant hacker man screen with a skull on it, which of course I'm gonna love. The pirate leader is this guy, who tells us that when you join the Crimson Fleet, there is no quitting. You are in for life, and the only way out is death. We're then introduced to this death as a pirate shoots what seems to be another pirate who is equipped with a knife as they probably try to quit the gang or at least escape. Overall, the Crimson Command Center looks like it's a multi-layered structure, perhaps even being underground in some kind of abandoned mine, as in the background here, we can see an elevator. Now, we're almost at the end of today's video here. For those of you who have followed me over on my YouTube community tab and on Twitter, you no doubt would have been updated already uh, with me updating everyone, saying that because of the YouTube algorithm, I've decided to split this massive video into two videos. The first one will focus on the first half of the showcase, and the second one, the second half, which actually just 
most works because the first half of the showcase in this video primarily focused on gameplay, which was my focus with, with this actual video breakdown, was breaking down the gameplay. The next video will go into depth just as much detail as I did here in regards to the character creation, outpost building, spaceship building, and so much more. But let's go ahead and finish out the gameplay portion of this video today with these next few scenes here that kind of go by rather quick. During these scenes, the Constellation leader tells us that the path ahead will be dangerous. However, they don't plan on stopping because whatever lies at the end of this path, whatever lies at the end of this journey, this space adventure will change humanity forever. And as far as the scenes themselves, we get a pretty interesting scene here of some people exploring what looks like a space station or building of some kind full of ice that looks rather abandoned. We can see a corpse up at the top here with some snow laying around, meaning this, this building is probably on an ice planet and was, and was probably damaged and exposed to the planet's atmosphere. But either way, pretty interesting verticality here again, and just overall an interesting new biome to explore. We can also see kind of like a loot box here in the lower right, so that's super interesting and super cool. Here we can see our player doing some zero gravity jumps in combat as other things and stuff float around as well. I can't wait to see how zero gravity works in this game. Will all objects in the room float around? Because as we all know in previous Bethesda Game Studios games, every object, even a book on a shelf, even a bowl on a table, are all interactable. So if gravity gets lost, does that mean everything around us will start floating around? Or is that only set for specific environments? Can we lose gravity on our ship at any certain time if it gets damage. Kind of curious how all this will just work, but either way, I can't wait for the zero-G combat as showcased in this little scene here. It looks like we're kind of in a space station or something, or a big spaceship, because we can see nets and straps on the side holding cargo in place. I doubt this would be set up this way if uh, the structure wasn't meant to be or go into space, so I guess this is probably a space station or a spaceship of some kind where the gravity is either non-existent or has been disabled. But another cool detail is the bullet casings actually float up. They don't magically fall down and defy gravity, so Bethesda is paying particularly attention -y to detail -y here. Here we can see our main player with yet another interesting weapon that almost looks very, very high-tech, and they're fighting a dinosaur! on the planet that is also pretty snowy. Maybe this planet is the same planet uh, in which the frozen structure was that we just saw. But either way, the next scene is really awesome. We see a space alien spider thing chasing us down the hallway, and what's cool is this spider seems to actually have animations set for the varying wall dimensions of this hallway. So maybe this is a specific encounter here that's kind of detailed for the player in this specific corridor, or maybe this is a creature we can see in buildings like this that'll scare the crap out of us and cause us to probably run away or find cover in which to fight it without getting eaten alive. You can also see what looks like maybe some explosive barrels here or something. Maybe we can shoot that to blow the creature up as it comes down the hallway like we see in horror movie tropes, but either way, pretty interesting. Our player decides to, to fight this thing immediately right in front of it with a handgun of all things, so I, I doubt that's going to work out well for them. I plan on not doing that. I plan on maybe falling back and shooting this corrosive liquid acid thing, uh, but whatever, to each their own. If he wants to feed himself to the creature, then that's fine. Here we can see what looks like a space mining operation going on. Now, I'm not sure if they're actually mining here or if they're trying to just dig out whatever this red and white circle is. The red and white circle looks like it's placed here, but it's not a complete circle, so maybe part of it's covered up by the rock, or maybe it's just kind of like a focusing beam area for the mining lasers to actually focus on. That's, that's probably what this is, but this definitely looks like some kind of lab or mining facility. It looks pretty clean, pretty science, and pretty awesome. Here we can see more space mining going down. We can see some miners with their cutters shooting away at stuff. One interesting thing of note here, though, is this doesn't look as much of like a mine as it does an archaeological dig. My guess is this actual scene, which has been something the community was speculating on and they have their own theory about this, which I kind of agree with, is this is actually the very opening of the game. Before the player joins Wins Constellation, we're a space miner or something like that, and maybe in our space mine, as we just try to mine resources or metals, we uncover some type of artifact. An artifact that actually catches Constellation's attention, and we as the player do something to also catch their attention as well, which leads us to joining them. Here we can see another scene which I believe to be part of the uh, 
introduction to the game, the prologue, the opening scene in the game, that opening quest, kind of like Skyrim's Helgen, this is what we do in Starfield when we start the game. Uh, they say that most dusters don't make it this far, so maybe most space miners don't survive long enough to get deep into the mines? I don't know what they mean by this, but this kind of makes me feel less secure about workplace security in the future here. Here we can see a pretty awesome sight, a deep mine, a deep cavern full of large blue crystals that seem to put off some kind of ray tracing glowing blue light on all the surroundings as well. I'm not sure if this is actually in the mine that we started at the beginning of the game like I was just talking about, or if this is a different place altogether, but either way it seems like they're trying to mine these crystals as we can see a push cart here on the right that might be used to load up the crystals and cart them away. Now this is kind of cool. This looks like an old abandoned museum straight from Fallout. We can see what looks like history and artifacts from the past of space exploration. We can see an old world satellite, what looks like the Apollo uh, modules around, and a lander up here as well. Very, very cool and maybe for some reason this this is on the Earth and the Earth is destroyed and post-apocalyptic, that's gonna get the Fallout and Starfield Cross Universe uh, conspiracy theorists going. But this is definitely an abandoned space museum of some kind, just indicative of the old world space technology in it. And I say old world, meaning old world in relation to Starfield, <laughs> not ours, because this stuff we still use. Then we see more space dinosaur stuff going on. This giant creature with the head of like a parrot almost is pretty intimidating, and it kind of shows us just how big the creatures in Starfield can get, which I'm super hyped for. I can't wait to fight some giant monster parrot dinosaurs. Now these scenes are fairly interesting, I think are very, very important in regards to the main quest of Starfield and Constellation's investigation into these artifacts, because this structure, this circle up here, looks like it is almost made up of the same material of the artifacts that we are trying to seek out, and the walls here are very ancient and they have kind of like hieroglyphic-like carvings and markings in them. This very much feeds into my theory that there is an ancient alien-like civilization who are leaving behind, the, or who have left behind these artifacts that we're trying to investigate and collect. You can even see it's like floating with space magic up here, so there's definitely some high space fantasy in Starfield and I can't wait for it. And then finally we have our character here walking into what very well could be either an intact artifact or what the artifacts and pieces create when they're pieced together. This is like a pretty huge, strange, spinning gyro thing as my cat meows in the background. Maybe it's a portal of some kind that takes us to an alien city. Watch this entire huge main quest for consolation of collecting these artifacts be just one small portion in the main quest. The first half, if you will, and the second half of the main quest that Bethesda's been trying to keep secret is when you put the artifacts together and you go into this portal, it takes you to an alien city because Bethesda has said there's four main cities in the game. We know of New Atlantis, we know of Neon, and we know of Aquila. So what's the fourth one? And that is everything. Hate to be a ball buster here or hate to kill the vibe, but I do want to split the video in half because the YouTube algorithm kind of hates videos that are as long as modern movies. So like I said earlier, it actually just works to split the video uh, and to do the next half of my showcase breakdown in my next video because the next half, the other video I'll be uploading is focusing on character creation, backstories, building our spaceships, building our outposts, and space combat. That's basically what the last half of the showcase was. So this video was gameplay focused. But either way, sorry to keep you waiting for this video for so long. I know I took a break for summer vacation and I know this video took longer than I meant for it to take, but here it is. It's finally here and the next video goes into some pretty interesting details as well, so be sure to watch the next one. But as always, thank you for waiting patiently for this upload. My uploads, my videos will now be more consistent than I have returned from summer break. And as always, Thank you for watching. Be sure to like the video and subscribe if you enjoy content like this. And be sure to check for links down in the description below for the Skullsy Discord channel, the Skullsy Patreon, and Skullsy merchandise. If you want to get your name added to a permanent future video shoutout list and get featured alongside these amazing people who have went above and beyond to support the channel and the community, all you have to do is support the channel over on Coffee, Patreon, or here on YouTube as an exclusive channel member. Like I said, links for all this and more are down in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching. Be sure to tune in next time for the last half of my huge showcase breakdown. I feel like I went on a huge journey and space adventure of my own just by doing this giant video. It, it just works.